He was awarded the, the prestigious Eureka Prize for medical research for solving one of the great puzzles of medical science. Not only did he prove that mental exercise reduces our risk of dementia, which means I'm in serious trouble, uh, but he also proved how. Uh, he is the author of It's Never Too Late to Change Your Mind. He's a research fellow in regenerative neuroscience at the School of Psychiatry at Kenzo Tech, otherwise known as the University of New South Wales. Uh, and he will share his thoughts on the use it or lose it brain. He is also uh, an expert salsa dancer. Andamar Sellenboy, please welcome Michael Venezuela. Thanks very much for that introduction and for the pleasure of being here to be able to talk to you about uh, something that's very important to me and I think is very important to you. Uh, and that is, how is it that the brain is, an, is able to change and adapt itself and actually uh, be responsive to the environment and also to our own thoughts? And the particular area of research that I have been working in for the last 10 years is what happens as we age. Uh, everyone out there is really very worried about dementia and the way that p men mental function can decline as we get older. Uh, and one of the positive messages, I think, is that by staying mentally active, we can actually do something about that. So now I'm going to, I guess, give you uh, an introduction. And, and, and with the theme of today's uh, talk, so you've had an entree, you've had a main course, and you've had dessert. So maybe you would think of this as the cheese platter after a nice meal. So I'm going to first of all share with you a quote uh, that I think is both so profound and also very poetic. And it reads, The most beautiful thing that we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion uh, is a stranger who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. And, and Einstein, when he wrote that, he went on to suggest <coughs> that this sense of awe and wonder lies not only at the heart of art and science, but also religion and spirituality. Now, I happen to think that the human mind is the greatest mystery of all. How, as we've heard, one kilogram or so of protoplasm can generate thought and emotion, creativity, language... Is, is truly unknown. As a neuroscientist, I have to admit that we don't really know how that fundamental mystery occurs. But today I want to shed a little bit of light on one small part of that mystery, which is this idea of neuroplasticity, which you may have heard. In the first half of my talk, I'm going to try to explain what scientists mean by the term neuroplasticity, try and develop quite a, a sophisticated understanding of this term, and then, very importantly, how is it that we can harness this knowledge to actually keep our brains healthy, which is what people are really hungry to know about. So you can think of this talk as covering both the art and the science of neuroplasticity. So what is it? In simple language, neuroplasticity refers to a vast range of changes that occur in the human brain in response to experience. Now... When we talk about those changes, you can first of all straight away uh, appreciate that we're talking about a number of changes, not just a single change. And these changes can occur at different spatial scales. So in other words, they can things can happen at the scale of tiny little molecules and the expression of genes, and I'll elaborate on that. Changes can also occur at the level of the whole cell and the connection between cells. And we've heard this morning how it's those connections between brain cells are so critical for thought and cognition, emotion, and so forth. And then I will touch on um, the next scale up, which how whole parts of the brain relate to each, each other, so what, what we call brain networks. And I will also make it very clear that these changes occur at different temporal scales. Some, some of these changes can occur within a matter of hours. Some take several weeks to happen and uh, in between we have changes that occur over a few days. So let's talk about molecules and genes, and as a very quick introduction into this topic, 
Every cell in our body contains the same DNA that we inherited from our parents. Now, obviously, a cell that is in your eye or is that in your teeth or the blood or the bone are, are very different. And they're different because they express different proteins, different structural elements. And the reason they do that is because only a very small part of the 40,000 or so genes in the DNA are actually being expressed. In other words, some are being turned on, some are silent, and some are actually being suppressed or downregulated. So that is why uh, we can talk about genes as a fixed, more or less fixed property that we inherit, but it's gene expression which is so dynamic. Now, in this uh, technology of a gene chip, you can see it's a very small piece of technology. Quite amazingly, if we have a tissue sample, like a bit of blood or a piece of tissue, uh, we can assess the activity level of all 40,000 genes in the, that we know of the, in the human body uh, as to whether they're on, off, or, or down-regulated. And so in, within that chip, it's made up of tiny little elements, and each element refers to the activity level of a particular gene. And so if you look in the very top left corner, there's a tiny little green dot. And so that green dot means that that particular gene in this particular sample had been upregulated or was very active. The next one may be a yellow, which means it's sort of not very active. The next one may be a black dot, and that means that it's not being expressed at all, and so forth across the whole 40,000 genes of the human genome. Now let's do a thought experiment. Uh, Susan Greenfield already talked about uh, some of the very strong changes that can occur when we move from, uh, in this case, a, a rat or a mouse, from its standard or normal housing conditions into the enrichment condition. So enrichment means uh, the, the kind of lifestyle we all want. So we have access to toys, we can explore and learn new things, we can do physical exercise through the running wheel, and there are more litter mates so we can socialise. So this is the kind of lifestyle you want to lead if you're a rat. Now... So what scientists have done is take out uh, the brains from rats that have lived in an enriched environment versus a standard environment and use this technology to assess well, what's happening at the level of the, of the genes, what genes are being turned on, off, or, or being held silent. Now, you may not be able to read this. In fact, I'm sure you can't read this, but that's not the point. Well, the point is that there is a vast array of gene changes that occur in response to an enriched environment. And what's most fascinating is that if you look at what I'm circling there, these changes can occur in as little as three hours. So in other words, just three hours of exposure to an enriched environment has changed all these myriad of genes in a very complex way. So in other words, and it's kind of a freaky thought, is just the very act of coming here and listening to the speeches and talks and concepts this morning you will have induced a cascade of molecular changes in your own brain which are now starting to percolate and filter out through the rest of, of the brain structure. So this is really where mind and brain is interfacing and interacting. Now let's move up a scale and we'll talk about the connections between cells. So, so far we've been really talking about the inner workings of a cell the nucleus and the expression of genes there. Now we're going to talk actually about the connections or synapses that we've heard about this morning. And so in this figure, we've zoomed up on one area, which is the synapse, which is the connection between two brain cells. A brain cell all by itself is obviously not very good for anything. We need to communicate and transmit information. And importantly, and very relevant to my topic, as far as we know, the strongest biological uh, substrate or uh, mechanism for dementia is loss of these connections between brain cells. So people who start to develop dementia have a very drastic reduction in connections between brain cells, the thinking and processing part of, of the human brain. Now, what research has shown, and quite amazingly, is that exposure to a complex environment, so moving from a standard housing condition to an enriched condition, increases the level of synaptic connections by this level. And if we look at the scale, if the animal that has lived in a standard condition, if we rate its level of synapses at 100%, those animals that have lived in enriched con conditions, the synaptic density has gone up by between 300 and 400%. So an amazing amount of plasticity 
uh, within the human brain in response to environment, in response to complexity and awe and stimulation and finding things engaging and interesting. So it's a very important message. Now, what about humans? What kind of experiments can we do to try and tease out this mind-body interrelationship and specifically its responsivity to complex environments? Well, this very famous experiment did a very simple um, intervention and that was to teach a group of adults how to juggle and then ask the question, well, what changes in the human brain? And amazingly, these areas, and now we're looking at a brain scan and we're looking at the brain on the top left from the side, on the top right we're looking at it from the back, and on the bottom left we're looking from the top or from below. And those highlighted areas are areas of the brain of people that learnt to juggle, which actually increased in mass. So the grey matter, the thinking part of the brain, actually expanded in volume in response to this few weeks of juggling. And if you look at the graph, if the, mat, the percent of grey matter at scan one was the baseline, you'll see that at scan two, after the juggling, it expanded. And then at scan three, when a few weeks after stopping uh, the training, you can see it's starting to drift back down to the baseline. So in other words, like a muscle, the human brain can actually expand in response to stimulation. And like a muscle, if we don't use it, we lose it. Uh, and so this is another quite fascinating insight into the responsivity and the plasticity of the human brain. Now, research that I've been involved with has been very interested not only in these kind of structural changes, but also functional changes. In other words, how the brain is processing information, uh, how the brain is responding to the challenges in the world. So let's imagine we have a group of older individuals that for all intents and purposes are perfectly well. So we've given them quite a number of uh, tests and they've performed completely normal. And so on, for all intents and purposes, we'd categorise them as a healthy older individual. Now, as, as Charlie T. already alluded to, what appears on the surface doesn't necessarily translate to what ha is happening in the brain. And in fact, when we scanned all of these healthy older individuals, and looked in their brain, we saw that about a third of them had, as their function suggests, very healthy brain, so little atrophy. Atrophy meaning just shrinkage of the brain. Shrinkage of the brain is bad, and it occurs generally as we get older. And so cognitively healthy people, a large group had little atrophy, as their function suggests, but a very significant proportion also had a lot of atrophy. In fact, enough atrophy if we had looked at their MRI scans by itself, we would have thought maybe they were starting to develop dementia. But on, for all intents and purpose, purposes, looking completely normal uh, on day-to-day -day mental function. So the question was, do the activity patterns of these individuals differ? And so this is some very, I guess, uh, late-breaking research that I can share with the group. Uh, and this is, uh, again, looking at the brain from the three what we call cardinal viewpoints, so looking from front on, from the side and from the top. And the crosshairs there are referring to the, you know, the hot spots, the, 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 the bits in red, are refer referring to areas that are really being active in response to a memory challenge in the scanner. So these individuals have been given a memory uh, test or a memory uh, challenge and we've made it harder and harder and harder and the the red areas indicate parts of the brain that are really uh, being active and called upon in order to do this memory process and the crosshairs uh, are focusing directly on a part of the brain called the hippocampus and the hippocampus as has been mentioned this morning is the really key memory part of the brain the memory center of the brain when the hippocampus fails people generally develop dementia so this is the pattern of brain activity in healthy older people, no atrophy, so what's normal. In the individuals with a lot of atrophy, the pattern is completely different. So again, the crosshairs is on the hippocampus and you'll note there's very little activity there. In fact, on this particular set of coordinates, there's not very much activity at all. Now let's talk about the reverse situation. 
Now the crosshairs have moved to the back of the brain, and this is, in fact, the area of maximal activity. So these individuals, when doing a memory uh, challenge within the scanner, are using a lot of the posterior areas of the brain to do this mental, mental uh, activity, which is the memory test. And again, on the same set of coordinates, you'll see there's not much activity in the individuals without atrophy. So in other words, as we get older, there is a phenomenon called compensation, which means that we can retain mental function by using new parts of the brain to do uh, old functions or old processes. So a very important part of the neuroplasticity story. And so kind of inspired by Einstein, neuroplasticity lies along a space-time continuum. So changes occur in the brain at different scales of space, moving from molecules to cells to brain networks. Changes also occur in the scale of time. So some of these changes can occur in an instant. Some changes require weeks and then months to happen. And fortunately, in a large proportion of individuals, if pathology starts to uh, appear in the brain, for example, a slow developing tumour, as Dr. Teo showed, or in Alzheimer's, if there is slow progressive loss of brain volume, our brains can compensate. Our brains can start to use new parts of it to do old problems. So that is neuroplasticity. That is what we mean by the term and, and the various different, uh, I guess, nuances of, of the concept. Now, unfortunately... A lot of things decline as we get older. Mental function, in fact, uh, many of the mental functions start to decline from the age of 20. There's a very s slow and steady and predictable decline in several mental functions uh, as we get older. And this is really exercising the minds of, of, of individuals out in society, but also governments and health professionals, because part on the very right-hand uh, part of this graph is that this is the area where people become at risk for dementia. Dementia increases in its prevalence or frequency by a factor of two every five years after the age of 60. And on average, people over the age of 80, there's a 25% chance that you may develop dementia. So it's a, it's a real concern. It's so, so much, in fact, that uh, a report by the International Monetary Fund just very recently has estimated that by the year 2050, the amount of expenditure that Western governments will need to spend on age-related issues like pensions, like health care, like residential care, will dwarf the global financial crisis by a factor of 10. So in other words, you know, this is like a rolling global financial crisis for the next few decades. Now, fortunately, these trends refer to group data, and it refers to group data assuming the status quo. Now, the status quo and group data doesn't equate to individual, individual potential. There is still an enormous amount of plasticity left in the brain as we get older, and we can rescue and revive and revi revitalise that plasticity by doing a range of uh, new things, and I'll talk about that in a second. Now, this is a, a nice bit of research done by one of my PhD students, and she has isolated a, a little test that we can do in the, in the rats is exquisitely sensitive to age-related change. Now, let me ask you, imagine if you went back home and suddenly where your fridge should be, there was now your couch, and where your couch should be, there was now your fridge. What would you do? I mean, you'd probably just freeze and go, what the hell? And then you start to have a very close look around. You'd examine, you know, the fridge, you'd examine the couch, and you'd try and work out what's the story. Now, funnily, funnily enough, Rats do a very similar thing. If we change one aspect of the environment, their first reaction is to freeze, and then they start to explore that change in the environment. In other words, we can use this exploratory behaviour as an index of memory. So if they remember where something used to be, they need to recognise that in order to, to do the exploration. Now, what Joyce has shown is that if we compare young and old rats on one version of the test where we just change... Uh, the particular object, so we introduce or swap a new object for an old object, old rats are just as good as young rats at identifying that and doing that behaviour. However, if we do something a bit more subtle, if we just change the position of one of the objects, 
well, then their performance decreases considerably. In other words, they don't recognise that change in the environment and therefore they don't explore that change as much. Now, by the simple intervention of providing a running wheel, letting them run for a, a few weeks and then doing the test again, we see that old rats that just have standard conditions remain impaired in this type of exploratory memory. However, older rats that do the running, uh, the running exercise get lifted back up to really the level of a young rat. So we've rescued this particular subtype of memory in these rats simply by running. Now, I would offer that you know, the same analogy applies to humans because if we maintain the status quo, well, then things decline. But if we do and engage in new activities, well, then we can also rescue some of our mental functions. And now this is being borne out in a number of clinical trials. Uh, you'll hear much more later in the conference about the power of physical exercise. In my area of research, which is prevention of dementia and keeping the brain healthy for as long as possible, physical exercise is a general tonic for the brain. It really has a number of excellent uh, beneficial properties. And in this research, uh, conducted by Australians from, from Melbourne and Western Australia, they showed that physical exercise can slow the rate of cognitive decline in individuals at risk for dementia. And it's a very robust and long-term long finding. Uh, there's also a lot of research now showing that the equivalent exercise but for the brain, so mental exercise, cognitive exercise, brain training, those kind of uh, interventions are also uh, have uh, good outcomes when it comes to keeping the brain healthy, keeping mental function uh, as high as possible over time. And this is just one of a number of clinical trials now which are pointing to the same thing. So in other words, physical exercise is good for the body and the brain. Mental exercise is particularly good for the brain as well. And so I talk about in my book the three keys. And these are the three keys which both human and rodent-based research really coming together to give us an insight on what is the most powerful types of activities to keep the brain healthy for as long as possible. Now the first of the keys is... Cognitive exercise, cognitive challenge, learning something new. It has to be challenging. Uh, you know, the, 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 the newspapers love the, the, the title, A Crossword a Day Keeps Dementia Away. But that's not enough. You know, uh, what we're talking about here is more akin to learning a new language, learning something that you'll find inherently quite demanding, but also enjoyable. The second of the three keys is the social key. Uh, you know, we had a wonderful presentation just before the break about the importance of interpersonal dynamics. And the, the reality is that to be successful socially, you really need to be using your brain quite a lot. You need to be anticipating what's, how someone will react. You need to be re reading other individuals very carefully and then having a schema in your head how you link what you're reading and, and, and predicting, how we can help smooth human relations. And so social activity is really very vital. Not only do people who start to develop dementia become worse at this, but it seems to be a leading risk factor. When people's social activity drops off, that can be uh, a kind of um, predictor that individuals will become worse and worse and, and eventually uh, f uh, develop dementia. And then finally is the third key, which is the physical exercise physical activity. As I've mentioned, uh, physical activity, physical exercise is a general tonic for the brain. Many of the same pathways that are activated just by cognitive activity, by mentation, are also activated in the brain by physical exercise. Uh, why it is that way, we still uh, don't know. But these three elements or these three types of activities are really the most powerful way we can keep our brain healthy for as long as possible. Now, can the three keys really change our brains for the better? This is some research that um, was published last year. And what we did was get a group of older people and administer a scale that we've developed called the Lifetime of Experiences Questionnaire. And that is essentially a review. It takes about 15 minutes. And we go through all the various cognitive, physical, social activities that the person has enjoyed throughout their lifetime and also, and also that are doing right now. And so it's part 
retrospective and part contemporaneous. And then we ask the question, well, what, what can we see in relation to this score um, in, in, inside the brain? And this is an individual with a very high LEQ score, so high three keys activities. And I've outlined here the hippocampus, and the hippocampus in this individual is very uh, fat and healthy. There's not much black space around it. Uh, th this is the kind of person who, who may have been a school principal, has retired, has gone back to university, is studying a master's degree, is volunteering in a number of uh, career groups and, 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 and is also uh, in, in a, a lawn bowls uh, society group. So an active switched on person. Uh, this next person has a very low LEQ score. The hippocampus has shrunk. Uh, the volume has declined. They're not very doing very much. They're staying at home, really watching TV. Maybe the only thing they do on a, on a weekly basis is go down to the RSL. Okay, now what we found, not, not only are these things uh, related in one point in time, but individuals with a high LEQ or high three keys activities, the rate of shrinkage of the hippocampus is much slower than the rate of shrinkage if you have a low LEQ. So in other words, staying switched on can help protect the brain from degeneration. And so now I'm getting close to wrapping up, but I would recommend this since everyone is plugging their book, I'll plug mine. And that is uh, a book where I've really tried to bring a lot of this information together. It's the science and the art of neuroplasticity, but I also touch on various other themes, such as a healthy heart equals a healthy brain. Uh, food for thought and, and various other topics. Now, what are the implications for society? Really, it is that in the same way we plan for retirement from a financial point of view, super, superannuation and all that, we have to plan for a healthy brain. And that means taking on new activities which meet the three keys. They should be mentally challenging. That is really very vital. And they should be fun. And I'm going to give a few examples uh, inspired from people that I find uh, that I really respect and admire. First of all is one of my collaborators, science professor Fred Westbrook. Uh, he's worked all his life with rats and is one of the real preeminent scientists in the area. And I asked him, Fred, well, you know, when we talk about enrichment in rats, what, what do you think is the best analogy when it comes to humans? And straight away he said, I think it's travelling. I think it's going overseas, you're immersed in a new environment, you're having maybe to struggle with a new language, you're meeting new people every day, you're walking more than you've ever walked in your whole life. You may be trekking in the Himalayas like this. Beautiful example. Uh, my Sifu, Jeff Bennett, you know, this is not him, but this is what he'll look like in a hundred years' time. <laughs> uh, you know, martial arts is a wonderful way of exercising your mind. You have to learn new techniques, you have to drill patterns. It's very social, it's very physical. And then Another favourite, uh, not of mine, but maybe of some other people, was uh, a quote from Professor Marilyn Albert, who has a similar interest, and she says shopping. You know, going shopping with my friends is... It requires all this planning, and we're very social, and we're walking all day. Uh, so there, there you go. Look how happy they are. And then this is my particular favourite, which is dancing. You know, again, you've got to use your mind to... Uh, remember the moves, you have to anticipate your partner, you have to select your partner very appropriately. Um, it's very social, as you can see here. It's very stimulatory. You can see someone's hand there is very strategically placed. It's, it crosses all cultural boundaries. Every culture uh, enjoys to dance, and dance is an important part of their culture. And it's also a timeless activity. I love this picture. Her hand's blurred because it's in mid-action. You know, she, she's, it's a very social activity, as you can see there. Her eyes are looking up and to the right. So that means she's using the left part of her brain, apparently, to remember things. So she's trying to rehearse and recall something. And just look at her smile. Uh, she's enjoying herself, and that is really what life is about. And so my central message for you today is that by enjoying the three keys of mental, social, and physical activity... We're cultivating a virtuous cycle. It's going to keep your brain healthy for as long as possible, but it's also going to uh, engender a quality of life and happiness, which is really what it's all about. So thank you very much.